There's an essay by Salman Rushdie in which he recalls hearing a US military spokesman during the Vietnam War describe a deadly bombing raid as having, quote, obtained a 100% mortality response. Put in those terms, doesn't sound so bad, does it? It's like when the CIA referred to their practice of enhanced interrogation. Just a few questions, you see, nothing to worry about. I mean, the questions might be enhanced with a bit of waterboarding, but so long as we don't call it torture, then what's the problem? So much of the current culture war is about language, and one of the ways you can spot a culture warrior is that they are always redefining terms while denying living. They'll say, trans women are women. And you, when you ask them what woman means, they'll accuse you of being a transphobe. The word transphobe, by the way, used to mean someone who feels hatred or prejudice towards trans people, but now it just means anyone who has concerns about safeguarding for women's only spaces or who believes that there are biological differences between men and women. Anyone who passed their biology GCSE, in other words. It's a lot of transphobes. And then there's the gender theorist Judith Butler, who said in an interview this week that gender-critical feminism is, quote, one of the most dominant strains of fascism of our time. And there you were thinking that fascism was an authoritarian political movement of the 20th century that pushed an extreme nationalism combined with claims of racial purity and a militaristic repression of dissent. Nope, what it actually means is someone who's sceptical about the notion that little girls have an innate fondness for pink dresses and My Little Pony. Most of us understand the term racism to mean hatred or prejudice against people on the basis of their race. Social justice ideologues, informed by critical race theory, claim that this is outdated. And actually, racism is an equation. Prejudice plus power. They've even managed to persuade some online dictionaries to update their definitions, even though it's only a handful of upper-middle-class activists who use the term this way. But now they can point to the dictionary and say, look, that's what it actually means. It's in the dictionary. Mm -hmm. And that proves it. And then you might complain that the dictionary is meant to record common usage, not re-engineer language according to the whims of the powerful minority. But that's just what a Nazi would say. Now that we've redefined the term Nazi to mean anyone we disagree with, see how this game works? This, quite, this kind of linguistic prestidigitation is easy enough to spot. We all know what Twitter is doing when it sets up a body to oversee censorship on its platform and calls it the Trust and Safety Council a phrase so chilling that it sounds as though it's comprised of a group of Sith Lords deciding on who they want to execute next. They may as well have called it the Happiness Patrol. Fans of Doctor Who will know what I'm <clears> talking <throat> about there. And sometimes they don't even bother to make their euphemisms convincing, like when CNN reported on protests in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and described them as mostly peaceful, in spite of the fact that behind the reporter you could clearly see burning cars and buildings. Or when the BBC reported on largely peaceful protests in June 2020, in which 27 police officers were injured. But of course, aside from the injuries themselves, those police officers were largely uninjured. So that's all right then. The critical social justice movement is derived from a postmodern understanding of the world in which language constructs our perception <clears throat> of reality. This is why it is a common belief among culture warriors that if they could just regulate how people speak, they can achieve their utopia. It's why they support censorship and why they keep redefining words. It works as a kind of cover for authoritarianism. That's why some of the most vicious and abusive people on social media will have love wins or be kind in their bio. You see, so long as you're saying the right words, your behaviour doesn't really matter because words are all that count. And this week, Radio Canada reported on a flame purification ceremony that had occurred a couple of years ago, which only now is receiving condemnation from political leaders. I'm sure you can guess what flame purification means. The body in charge of elementary and secondary schools in southwestern Ontario had apparently authorised the ritualistic burning of books for educational purposes. Almost 5,000 books were removed from shelves and destroyed or recycled if they were judged to contain outdated racial stereotypes. Some of these that were burnt had their ashes used as fertiliser to plant a tree. What a beautiful gesture. Uplifting, progressive and environmentally conscious. And you might say, well, you know, they're just books, just objects, they don't have feelings. <clears throat> Which is true, but there's a reason why we balk at the image of burning books. Now, I'm not suggesting, of course, there is any kind of moral equivalence between the Canadian authorities and the Third Reich. <laughs> It's really not the same thing, but it's always worth noting that so many of these social justice activists seem to borrow from the tyrant's playbook in their year zero approach 
to the arts and history. And this seems as good a time as any to remind ourselves of the true meaning of the word fascist. When those claiming moral authority start purging society of elements they disapprove of, we know where that leads. Those of us who know a thing or two about history do anyway. Which is perhaps why history itself is the <clears throat> current target. Every week, there seems to be a news story about activists who want to see historical statues toppled or artefacts removed from public view. Last week, it was the statue of Thomas Guy at the hospital he founded in 1721, <clears throat> which the governing body has now decided to remove. And at Goldsmiths University, there were calls to take down statues of Sir Francis Drake and Lord Nelson. Hmm. And now in the Netherlands, a golden coach used to transport the royal family on ceremonial outings has come under fire because of an illustration of slaves on one of its panels. It was built in the late 1800s, so it would be surprising if the artists in question had the identical values to the intersectional activists of today. But no, historical context doesn't matter. As one of the activists put it, they should chop it up and burn it. <laughs> yes, because the best way to learn about history is to delete the unpleasant parts so we never have to think about them again. And recently it's even become fashionable to burn copies of Harry Potter. Why? Because the author J.K. Rowling is an evil transphobe. Not that she's ever actually said anything transphobic, but, you know, we don't need shared definitions anymore. If activists say she's a transphobe, she's a transphobe. That's all there is to it. That's their lived experience, and you can't argue with that. Even the pop duo Jedward tweeted out that J.K. Rowling's books would make decent kindling for a romantic fire. But then, I suppose if you're talentless and illiterate, the very concept <laughs> of books will make you uncomfortable. I remember as a child seeing those <clears throat> images on TV of protesters burning copies of Salman Rushdie's novel, The Satanic Verses, on the streets of Bolton and Bradford. I was only a child, but I instinctively knew that this was wrong. Rushdie later wrote that seeing his own book being crucified and then immolated left him with the sense that now the victory of the Enlightenment was looking temporary, reversible. If you visit the Babelplatz in Berlin, the site where students burnt more than 20,000 books under the watchful eye of Joseph Goebbels, you'll see a commemorative plaque with a quotation from Heinrich Hein, where they burn books, they will in the end burn people too. We need to be wary of the revisionist impulse because it's one that is shared by all authoritarians. We should confront history and learn from it, not consign it to the memory hole.